Please welcome your panelists for Avoiding War with North Korea, moderated by New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof. Thanks for joining the most, the single most timely uh, session at the Milken Conference. Uh, we're delighted to have a terrific panel here for you. We're going to be resolving the North Korea issue over the next 60 minutes. So uh, let me get started and, and introduce uh, our panel. Um, from your left, uh, we have uh, Jean Lee, who was the Pyongyang bureau chief for the AP. And so one of the uh, few Americans who was actually lived in North Korea. She then um, escaped journalism and is now running the Korea program at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. Um, now, here we have uh, Yasuhide Nakayama, who uh, is from a venerable Japanese political family and is a member of the House of Representatives, the chair of the Committee on Foreign Relations, a key ally of Prime Minister Abe. Um, John Park uh, from Harvard, a uh, longtime Korea watcher, expert on, on uh, security issues and on sanctions, um, one of my guides to, uh, to, to, to the North Korea issue. Um, and Governor Bill Richardson, who has uh, been making forays to North Korea since the 1990s. Um, and, you know, we have this long history of trying to interact with North Korean officials, trying to get what we want. Governor Richardson is actually just about the only person I can think of who has negotiated successfully with North Koreans and actually got, um, got, got some things that we want, namely people out. If I'm ever detained somewhere in the world, I want Governor Richardson on that case, OK? <laughs> um, John Park, you are actually just back from South Korea. You were watching the meeting between uh, Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in there. Um, so tell me, what's your take? Is there going to be denuclearization? Um, should we be cheering? What, what's your take? Sure. I, I wanted to start off with, with a quote. In uh, the US Army, there's a saying that between the terrain and the map, the terrain always wins. One thing that's definitely happening on the Korean Peninsula is that the terrain has completely changed. Uh, if you look at it from the leadership structures and the structure of the way that they're managing the issues, we really haven't seen this before. Uh, in the case of President Moon in the Blue House, it is a very small clique within the uh, Blue House that is formulating and implementing this game plan. On the North Korean side, we have Kim Jong-un and his inner circle. Uh, and then in the White House, we have uh, President Trump uh, using, until most recently, Director of CIA Pompeo. So the intelligence channels, uh, I think, gives a sense of how we had these very accelerated high-level discussions and coordination uh, and the idea of broad agreement. Uh, so in many respects, last week, you got the sense that the Friday summit that took place just days ago uh, was all prearranged. And in that sense, the fact that you have this live televised event gave the sense that there was nothing left to chance, per se. But the overall mood is one where we still have this sense of it's very positive to have discussions <coughs> and, and movement on this uh, permanent peace mechanism idea. But there are many who are very skeptical about the denuclearization. And uh, if you look at the current. Do, do those many include you? I have to say that there are some new things that are happening that I'm revisiting that. Not in the sense of hope for immediate or the likelihood of immediate denuclearization, but there has been reference to something that's new. And it doesn't sound new, but it is in terms of the details. Uh, it still has to be hammered out in more, more you know, specific uh, uh, terms, but this idea of a denuclearization mechanism. Uh, and so from that, there is, I think, this, this notion that you're going to have an accelerated timetable where it is going to be action for action, but not the long, drawn out, precarious type, but in many respects, racing to complete certain stages. And as we've uh, recently heard, the uh, North Koreans are offering to dismantle their nuclear test facility uh, and essentially have international inspectors. President Moon just announced that he will be inviting the UN to certify that this uh, site has been uh, dismantled. So these are the types of areas that uh, I think the, the pace of it is truly spectacular. Uh, things are happening in, in the measurements of, of days. And the final thing I'd mention is the events of, of this past week and the Panmunjom Declaration, this single event, the same event, the same document, has led to skeptics becoming more skeptical and optimists becoming more optimistic. And I think that's the part we're going to you know, have to unravel, but uh, we are going to have the accelerated meeting soon. Uh, the next one up is the uh, summit between President Trump 
and uh, President Moon and President, uh, sorry, Chairman Kim Jong Un, I should say. Um, let me push you a little bit on that because I mean this is a moment where, on the one hand, we have people ready to hand over the Nobel Peace Prize to President Trump. On the other hand, people saying, ah, oh, this is basically all the same since 1992. Um, and so are you agnostic about whether there will be denuclearization? Or I mean, do, do you think it may actually happen in the next few years in, in the sense that North Korea will fully give up its uh, nuclear warheads, its nuclear program? Is that, is that a possibility, do you think? I think that part of it is uh, something that will clearly be deferred, but uh, the idea of these three leaders coming up with their own metrics of effectiveness and success, that's a part that I think is unique, and a lot of that has been taking uh, place behind closed doors. But when you look at the idea of denuclearization, uh, there is a lot of contention right now about what is the definition of denuclearization, but there is something that is an echo of about a decade ago when six-party talks were going on, this multilateral mechanism to try to affect the peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, there was something called nuclear disablement. And the idea was to uh, destroy, uh, as a part of the agreement, uh, complexes, parts of the Yongbyon nuclear facility to show that this is a path towards the broader denuclearization. Now, the, the demolition of the cooling tower in that time period was the, the symbol of it. Some are making the comparison that the uh, dismantlement of the nuclear test facility is that. But uh, I think these are, this, the emphasis is on things that are, are very much uh, <coughs> visible and tangible to make the you know, momentum continue. I, you know, this is not to say that uh, we are expecting the immediate denuclearization, North Korea giving up uh, their nuclear weapons, but it's this process that I think is, is different in how they're going to do it. I mean, I, I guess my um, sense is that, you know, after having seen the cooling tower blown up, et cetera, um, I'm very skeptical about promises of denuclearization. But I also think that even short of that, um, that process is useful and that the agreed framework in 1994 did not solve the problem. But there was actually a period there where new, uh, where new nuclear materials were not, new plutonium was not being, um, being produced. So I, um, indeed, even if, it, even if a full result is not achieved, there is some chance for, for progress uh, there. Gene, I, I want to go to you because you've actually, I mean, you've, you lived in Pyongyang, you lived in North Korea, um, and you've been following both. <laughs> so tell, give us a little bit of a setting of what life is like on the ground in North Korea, what Kim Jong-un's constraints are, what, he, what his goals are uh, as, as he's preparing for the summit with President Trump. Yeah, let me, let me show you a little bit of what it looks like um, on the ground in North Korea. Now, I have um, had the opportunity to spend an unhealthy amount of time in Pyongyang, although it's given me a lot of insight. And I was there on October 10th, 2010, on this overcast day at Kim Il-sung Square when Kim Jong-un made his first appearance, not only to us, but also to his people. So think about that, that's less than eight years ago. And I remember when he walked out and stepped forward. How is this baby-faced young man in his mid-20s going to lead a country that a population with a per capita, estimated per capita GDP of less than $18,000 per, you know, per person, compare that with South Korea, which has a per capita GDP of more than $30,000. How is he, with these chronic food shortages, lack of electricity, uh, going to convince his people, forget about us, convince his people that he has the right and the might and the vision to lead that country for decades to come? Remember that he's the third leader, and then they, they rule until they pass away, if all goes well for Kim Jong-un. How is he going to convince his own people that he has the ability to lead them. And I mention this because I do think that this period, the first part of his leadership, has been focused on building his base, purging the uh, elite core, the military, of elements who might oppose him, and uh, making sure that he can convince his people, that he can defend them. And at the core of that has been this policy of using uh, how to defend his people, and so he's been using nuclear weapons, and also how to carry them forward uh, to get them out of this crushing poverty. Because let's, let's, uh, let's just paint a picture, and several of us, Governor Richardson and I have been there together, uh, we only get the propaganda. 
not only do you get the pretty pictures from North Korea's own state media, but we also get the picture that foreign media bring us. And unfortunately, most foreign media are only taken on a very sort of orchestrated trip, and I would like to hear more about that. <laughs> Hopefully we'll talk about that. I was there for three to five weeks at a time every month, and there was no way they could put on the theater for me every day. And what I saw when I left the, when I left the Capitol was a country that's completely underdeveloped, absolutely impoverished. When the sun sets for most of these villages, there is no light. I was driving through villages in the countryside where the only light were the headlights from our car. So just keep this in mind. He is a leader who is under a lot of pressure, both domestically in terms of maintaining his hold on power and also in terms of the economy, trying to show his people that he can lead them out of this and nuclear weapons are part of that strategy. So I just want to paint that picture because I think sometimes we only get the propaganda, but remember this is a, a very poor country, a leader who is under a lot of pressure. And Jean, there are, I mean, there are competing theories about why this is all coming together now. So one theory is that we have uh, put such pressure on him, partly with China's cooperation, that this has forced him to make concessions that he otherwise would not want to. Another theory is that now he has achieved uh, deterrent and the capacity to deliver it, maybe not with 100% reliability, but uh, enough to, 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 make, to make us nervous enough to feel that he has achieved that deterrent and that that is what has brought him uh, to the table. And a third theory is that this is Moon Jae-in uh, maneuvering frantically to try to protect Seoul from the consequences of a conflict between the US and, and North Korea. So which theory is cl closer to reality in your view? I think all of that is part of the calculation. Uh, you know, I, I might be the only analyst who wasn't surprised by all of this, and I've been writing about it for more than a year and laying out how I thought this would happen. And unfortunately, it's played out exactly as I predicted. And I'm not a fortune teller. It's just that when you're there in Pyongyang seeing this uh, strategy, take momentum, you see how it's going to play out. And as I said, I did think, I, I think I wrote for the Wilson Quarterly, the Wilson Center publication, that we, with this new president in the White House, who's unpredictable, and also campaigns saying he would sit down with Kim Jong-un, that we had a window of opportunity. However, I said that if he didn't, if he continued with that rhetoric, Kim Jong-un would use that to his advantage, use it to justify the building up of nuclear weapons, the testing, because he can tell his people, I know we're poor, but I am, pouring resources into this program so that I can defend you. This will make us untouchable. And he's done precisely that, and he's accomplished that. He's now said, I'm, he's actually used the rhetoric, the fire and fury, to, to get his program to the place where he feels comfortable and feels like he can defend the country. Uh, and then I, I did think that, as I said in some of my, my, my stories and my commentary, the whole point of that was ultimately to be such a threat that he would get the United States to the negotiating table and try to negotiate a peace treaty. And I don't know that he's actually going to want to resolve this issue on nuclear weapons right away. I do suspect that he's going to use it as a bargaining tool. I think we all probably agree on that. And what price are we going to have to pay to convince Kim Jong-un that he can give up those weapons? That is a big question. Now, you asked about President Moon. I think President Moon, from the very beginning, I mean, for, for many, many years, has wanted this, and he's been preparing for this. Remember, he is a child of the Korean War. He was born to North Korean refugees who were evacuated in the early, from North Korea during the early months of the Korean War. He himself was born in the last few months of the Korean War. His family in North Korea. This is something he's very passionate about, his engagement with North Korea. Uh, he has been patient for the first year of his presidency because he needed to show the strength of the alliance between South Korea and the United States. So he's been patient in trying to balance his policy of engagement with this, this, this policy of maximum pressure. But when he saw the opening, he jumped right in. And that was an opening uh, from Kim Jong-un. And so he has been able to kind of unveil this policy un and, and take advantage of that. And, um, and also put himself in the driver's seat here, in a sense. And no longer is South Korea uh, kept on the sidelines, which is something that he was certainly concerned about um, in, with this potential of bilateral North Korean-US relations. 
Nakayama-san, um, the Japan is has always been a crucial player uh, in this area. But is there concern that in Japan now that the country is being marginalized to some degree? That we have uh, South Korea and North Korea driving the relationship to some degree. We had uh, President Xi Jinping recently with his uh, summit, and obviously they're playing a, a key role uh, with the North. Uh, now President Trump uh, presumably about to meet Kim Jong-un. Is there concern that Japan's interests might be put to the wayside, that, for example, a deal might um, require North Korea to give up ICBMs, but not uh, medium-range missiles that could target Tokyo, or, um, or well, not raise the issue of, of the uh, kidnapped Japanese. Is there, is there anxiety that Japan is being left out of the picture? Mm. Uh, at the first beginning, uh, before I make a comment, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much who gathered uh, here especially the uh, uniform that you are wearing, the armed forces of the United States. Uh, 73 years ago, we are not allies. We fought against each other, our ancestors. But now we made a reconciliation. And uh, we fought, we fight against the uh, uh, lots of evil uh, of the world. And uh, I'm really proud U.S. military and our uh, Japanese self-defense forces are strong allies, uh, whole nation. So on behalf of Japanese people, I really would like to say thank you very much to the, the soldiers who gathered here. And uh, one thing I'd like to tell you, I learn English by myself from Hollywood movies called Beverly Hills Cop 1. <laughs> so my English skill is not so good. I, I might say so-so, so please be patient to listen to my English, OK? So um, uh, think 73 years ago. I am a Japanese. I don't want to say this, but uh, maybe during those periods, every people who lived uh, other countries look my country at that time now compared to North Korea. Maybe North Korea in 20th century is Japan. Maybe. But uh, now we are allies. Means we have to learn from the history. So North Korea, if, I mean, the, the Korea Peninsula and this East Asia region is the only one place Cold War still exists. And I live in Osaka. So if Kim Jong-un pushed the button of the missile, it only eight minutes to shoot my family in Osaka. And we feel threat. We know the risk. And, to, and how to hit the risk of the war is the title of this meeting. And uh, one thing, uh, if I write the kanji character, Kim, do you know what does it mean, Kim? It's gold. President Trump loves gold. <laughs> so gold goes fit, I guess. But uh, this is not so easy. Um, remember, uh, 1945, February 4th, what happened at that time? In Crimea, in Yalta conference, Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin together and they make, make a discussion and decision. Why don't we take Korea Peninsula from 38 degree line up to north to the Soviet Union? Stalin, bring it. <coughs> OK, to your souvenir. OK, 38 degree line to the south, to, to the UN, which means United States. And still, Korea Peninsula, same shape, same content, no change. But this time, it may be a change if we strong will together focusing on the Korea Peninsula. But uh, we have uh, uh, three concerns, as you know. One is the adoptees by North Korea. We never forget about uh, Mr. Wambia from Ohio. He 
I think he killed by North Korea. Even he came back safely. Uh, after a few days, if he came back from North Korea, he passed away. And uh, so we have uh, 17 uh, victims captured by North Korea. And the second is a missile. Third is a nuclear. So of course, we are going to talk with South Korea, China, but uh, Korea Peninsula, for me, it looks like a scale, Libra. So when you put the weight on the scale plate, scale 50-50 equal fitting. So 50-50 is a balanced. But so if you put the weight, uh, United States, maybe here China, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, and Japan will be well balanced. But if you move this weight to the other, together, maybe this balance will lose. So this is the Korea Peninsula, and this is six party talks. And this is how we, go, we are going to think about compared to 20th century of Yalta conference, and now it's a 21st century version of Yalta conference just begun. So how are we going to talk with all the six countries? Are you going to make a profit for this? Or be a gentleman? No eager, no, you know, uh, to get everything. But uh, one thing I'd like to ask the professor the, that the, uh, two days ago, uh, Mr. Putin and uh, Moon Jae-in called each other officially. And uh, Putin said to the Moon Jae-in that uh, Russia also would like to into the meet, you know, the talks. So I thought Russia already sell, sold, it, sold, the, sold their license to Chinese Beijing, but it wasn't. So still, we, you know, we have to uh, wear the glass of the 20th century. What is a democracy? What is a liberty, liberal? What is a communist? What is a CCCP, USSR? This vision has to be needed if you look at the, uh, our region. My English is correct? Okay. Oh, it's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, and I mean, North Korea sees a role for Japan in this. And I'm wondering whether Japan is prepared to play that. I mean, North Korea, I think, uh, clearly remembers that Japan paid large sums to South Korea in the 1960s. And I think it's salivating over the prospect of a similar amount of money coming to the north uh, to settle old issues um, as part of this kind of a peace process that they believe they've introduced. Is that something that Japan might be prepared to do in the coming years? We will talk with the United States, Donald Trump, the president. We will follow his footsteps. We will watch and see how it goes. Uh, when we, this is actually, this year is a 40th anniversary, uh, uh, how do you say, re, uh, reunion uh, between the Chinese uh, official diplomat. Right. D diplomatic policy. D establishment of diplomatic relations. Yes, it's a 40th anniversary. So why Chinese a uh, little bit uh, calm down against uh, Japan, except POA activities expanding the South China Sea or the western part of Pacific Ocean, or submarine activities. But um, in this sense, uh, how do you say? Uh, uh, but uh, I, 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 yes, of course, we are preparing uh, lots of uh, happenings after this, but uh, we have to, uh, okay, so, so when the Chinese, uh, when we, the, between the China, Japan diplomatic relations uh, again started, and we cut it the Taiwan relations, uh, that was before the United States shake hands with China 
at that time. Right. But this time, US go forward compared to our movement. So this time, we will watch the US government will. And, uh, but uh, we focusing on the same purpose. So, and uh, now, uh, compared to the uh, dipl diplomatic re relations between other countries, uh, the president, between the president Donald Trump and uh, our Prime Minister Abe's meeting, Macron and Trump, Merkel and Trump, who played the golf at the Amalau? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, this is not, uh, you know, the, it seems to me it's not, uh, our Prime Minister better make sense. Uh -huh. So uh, let's call a lot, let's shake hands a lot, let's hug a lot, let's play golf a lot. And uh, we play the role to, to, to protect the freedom of Korea Peninsula. And no more nuclear facility for just, not just North, but the South also. All the Korea Peninsula have to be zero nuclear weapons and mid-range missiles. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Governor Richardson, since I mean you're somebody who has actually negotiated with the North Koreans, the North Korean officials I've spoken with speak very uh, highly of your ability to uh, see the picture and to negotiate with them. Um, what if you were planning? Uh, the, the meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, what would you see as a successful summit and how would you organize it to try to maximize the, the return for the U.S.? Well, what I would start out by saying at the risk of taking credit from President Trump, who's already taken credit for everything, uh, l let me say that I would caution against this grandiose optimism that has sprung since some very good developments have taken place. I'm not going to diminish that. But here are my worries. I would say to the president, which will never happen, because uh, he won't listen <laughs> to me or anyone. One, I would say, Mr. President, um, first, I'm a little worried about the distance between the US and South Korea on some basic positions, on denuclearization, uh, on the step-by-step -step process the South Koreans want, uh, on denuclearization before there's any kind of trade benefits or sanctions lifted, uh, while our position is very clear. Uh, no uh, positive gives unless there is complete denuclearization. So bridge the gap also on the issue of the nuclear umbrella, uh, because you know un under the treaty we have ships, we have nuclear subs uh, in the region, uh, in Japan. Uh, Japan needs that umbrella. So bridge the U.S. South Korea gap. Number two, I would say, what is also important is. There's a basic difference between what denuclearization means for us and the North Koreans. What? The North Koreans uh, see it as basically a freeze, a limitation on existing weapons. Uh, number three, uh, uh, and what do we see? We see complete dismantlement. There's a bridge that needs to be uh, fixed. Um, I would also say, don't forget the human rights issues. One, the three Americans detained. You know, Mickey and I and our foundation, we were involved in the Warmbier case, and, mm -hmm. you know, ended tragically. Uh, secondly, the remains of our soldiers. We've been talking and honoring our soldiers. Uh, I think you covered it, Nick, but in 08, I brought seven remains back from uh, the North Koreans. They wanted to resume the recovery program. That's important. Third, I think there are some South Korean, North Korean reunification family issues uh, that that can be uh, improved upon at the summit. And then there are other issues that you know, just don't come up. One, stop exporting chemical weapons to Syria. Two, nuclear and missile exports. Uh, go for that, stopping those. Uh, and then see if you can set up 
a process, a process that may not, I think the president wanted, at one point I heard him say that he wanted denuclearization before the summit. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. I think, is denuclearization ever gonna happen? You know, I, I'm very skeptical, but you know, you never can say never. You never can say never. Down the road, you know, with proper framework of negotiations, uh, it's possible, but very remote. But I think, and my last point, is I think Kim Jong-un has something up his sleeve. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But, you know, why is he doing this? He's doing this because he wants to stay in power. And he knows we're the only ones that can knock him off, maybe with, you know, with other players. He, he wants to stay in power. He loves power. He's killed his family. He's killed relatives. He's, you know, changed the military. Secondly, he wants sanctions re, uh, lifted. He's not going to get that. But I think China here has played a positive role after years of not doing virtually anything. I, you got to give China a little credit. Nobody likes to do that. But, you know, they squeezed, they had border enforcement, you know, those UN sanctions, coal, oil, uh, fish, uh, foodstuffs, uh, North Korean workers not bringing money back in. I think that had a bite. What else? Um, why is he doing this? I always remember the North Koreans saying, you and the United States and North Korea should settle this. You know, China shouldn't be part of this. South Korea shouldn't be. Japan, we're the big guys in the region. This is what they'd say to me countless times. Let's work something out. My last, I keep saying my last point, <laughs> is this. You know, in a negotiation with the North Koreans, how do you negotiate with them? Well, the first thing I can tell you, they don't think like we do. They think they're always right. Everything comes from the deity, from Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, uh, the new leader now. Um, so they're never wrong. They don't believe in quid pro quos. They believe in, all right, well, uh, after a certain period of time, we'll give you more time to come to our position. That's, that's their idea of, but when you look at details, you look at frameworks, you look at, you gotta really delve into what exactly they're signing on to because they're gonna bob and weave and then in a negotiation, Nick, you know, there's going to be this setting of the president sits here, this team sits here, the North Koreans sit across each other. The North Koreans are going to vent. They're going to go very harsh. The way you make a deal with the North Koreans is on the sidelines, in a meal. You walk. You know, that's how I made some of the, on the prisoners, on the American pilots, on, on Remains, you do it informally at a dinner, walk it. So I hope the president has patience to like, you know, just stay and informally try to engage Kim Jong-un. The only reason I think there's a possibility of a denuclearization is maybe if you look at Kim Jong-un's uh, January 1st speech, he said very clearly, I, you know, I don't need to keep testing nuclear facilities. He said it January 1st. Mickey showed it to me. Um, I don't need to test anymore. Uh, I've got my military capability. I want to improve my economy. So I think if, if he is ready to do that and is ready to trade his weapons, although I'm, I'm going to say again, I'm very skeptical that that is the end game, that what he's going to want in return, you know, talk about a Marshall Plan in World War II. It's going to be a very big Marshall Plan that includes uh, every country uh, right here in this panel. So, I don't know, I just rambled on. I, I just think that, that we've got to be hopeful, but enormously skeptical. Uh, we've got to, I just hope the president is prepared, and I'm not sure he will be. I think we've got to think this very carefully. We've got to talk to the Japanese. I mean, they got some you know, real domestic and foreign policy, they've been a friend with the South Koreans. You know, things are very, they each are nominating each other for Nobel Prizes, but you know, there, there's a little gap in our positions, the US and South Korea. So we got a lot of things to straighten out in a month. So let me 
push you on that a little bit. So I, I very much share your um, hopeful skepticism. I would be extremely surprised if uh, denuclearization actually happens in any kind of timetable in the next few years. And I've just seen this show too many times for too many years. Um, I also think that South Korea already seems to be promising a Marshall Plan. And if you look at the Panmunjom Declaration, then it's all about providing infrastructure. It's all about providing uh, economic development in a way that seems to recall the kind of policies that Kim Dae-jung pursued. Doesn't that reduce our uh, leverage? Doesn't that reduce President Trump's leverage uh, if, he, if, if Kim Jong-un thinks that he's already going to get that from the South, if the South and the North are already kind of embarked on this um, journey of peace? But, but also, even if, even if we're right to be skeptical about denuclearization, even if North Korea is going to blow up a few things but not really end its program, not allow uh, intrusive inspections, then isn't that still maybe a good thing? And that it does deal with some of the other issues you mentioned, like transfer of materials to Syria, uh, perhaps human rights in some dimension, economic development, a process that begins to reduce the risk of war and perhaps begins to tame North Korea. So can well, one be both skeptical and, and optimistic about other kinds of changes? Yeah. You know, I remember the father, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-il. He was a rug merchant, a deal maker. OK, uh, we'll give you this prisoner, but you send President Clinton, or you send uh, Clapper, or you send Jimmy Carter. But if it's really low level, send Richardson or whatever. Uh, and you get something in return. Kim Jong-un is, I, I think he's got a broader vision. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, for years, we have underestimated him. We thought, uh, you know, this is a guy that's going to blow up the world. He doesn't know what he's doing. I think he's basically a rational actor, unpredictable, uh, enormously vindictive, dangerous. But I think what what I'm saying, Nick, is, is yes, yes, I think that leverage is reduced. I, I just saw the package of the South Koreans, that what they wanted, the step by step. Yeah. I mean, it's way different than what we're saying, which is you've got to denuclearize, and then maybe we take off sanctions. And they're saying, no, no, step by step. You know, you do this, you're going to get uh, a train. I saw that there's a train and infrastructure. You, you're going to get trade benefits. We're going to, you know, have joint, uh, joint enterprise zones. Um, so, I, I, I guess what I'm what I'm concluding is that w another point. Because Kim Jong Un is in charge, I think that is, and he there is no Kim Gae Won who was their nuclear negotiator. He's doing it all. This is why the prospect of denuclearization. I think we've got to really think it through as it might happen. And, and, and let's have, uh, you know, let's come back, not with what Kim Jong-un wants, which is, I bet you we can get more of the freeze here on the weapons, a, a freeze, a, a curbing of the use. Uh, you know, let's have a, a staged negotiation. I don't think 2020 is a realistic goal, which is what the administration has said, or maybe a little longer. But, but, and, and then the most important point that that hasn't happened is inspections. We got to inspect. We didn't inspect in the agreed framework, you know, young beyond a little bit. And what did they do? They did, they enriched uranium. They've made a secret deal with Pakistan. We've got to have international inspectors, hopefully US inspectors from Los Alamos, Sandia, our nuclear labs. Uh, there's got to be real oversight, or it's, it's, it's worthless. And you know, Kim Jong-un has said, well, in May, I'm going to invite ex experts to see this facility that's already been demolished. That's not going to be enough. John, um, our leverage as we move toward the meeting with uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, arises in large part, or is perceived to arrive in large part from sanctions, economic sanctions, partly imposed by China. Um, you've done a lot of research on those sanctions and effectiveness. Um, so how 
much leverage will we indeed be having in the, in the coming weeks, and in particular in light of the recent reports that China is already actually relaxing those sanctions? Sure. You know, on the sanctions piece, uh, it, it presents a very interesting puzzle in the sense that after every single round of North Korean advancements on their nuclear ballistic missile testing, there was another round of sanctions. So in many respects, you see almost this phenomenon of sanctions as antibiotics. As you apply it on the North Korean regime more and more, uh, there is this inconvenient fact that they have been able to procure the items that they need for the next stage of advancement. But in practice, what we're seeing is the North Korean regime, and frankly, we don't analyze North Korea as a country, but as a 1%, 99% phenomenon. The North Korean elite state trading companies and those businessmen doing the uh, type of procurement on behalf of what we call North Korea Incorporated, They've migrated to the Chinese marketplace, and they've embedded in the Chinese marketplace. So when it comes to this kind of procurement, uh, there is this mechanism now where in the primary instance, applying sanctions does create a setback. But in the secondary and tertiary spaces, we're actually seeing adaptation. And frankly, the normalcy of North Korean activities in the Chinese marketplace that raises this question about the efficacy of sanctions. Now, I, I don't argue that sanctions don't work. It's just how high and how high the bar is in terms of this type of impact. So when it comes to the thesis that maximum pressure and sanctions is what brought North Korea to the table, I th certainly think that's a part of it. But I think we have to be cautious in giving too much credit uh, to the sanctions piece of it uh, in the sense that there is, again, this phenomenon that's already taken place. The, the last thing I'd mention about the sanctions piece is that when you ask this question, are they working or not, one uh, very specific objective metric is smuggling. We're seeing smuggling when it comes to oil going into North Korea, and sometimes reportedly through Russian companies, uh, and then the transshipment of North Korean coal to markets abroad uh, through uh, different conduits. So there is this coping mechanism aspect of it, but uh, I think the sanctions piece is the element that has created a certain type of diplomatic room, uh, particularly for the South Korean game plan to unfold. A lot of the activity that we're seeing right now, uh, there is a very specific South Korean role in terms of creating a venue, a table for negotiations. And frankly, I think that's the side of things that we're probably going to see more momentum going forward as well. Um, Gene, the, um, what, I mean, a, a lot of the things that are discussed are, in a sense, um, sort of holding patterns. So we, maybe we try to deter North Korea for a while, or maybe we do a freeze for a freeze for a while. Uh, but the implicit assumption that people are reluctant to articulate is that we do this for a while until the North Korean regime changes or is no longer around. I think that was one of the undercurrents in the agreed framework back in 1994. Um, is, so you've lived in Pyongyang. How, how stable is the regime? Is the, would you, bet that the regime is going to be around in another 10 years? Uh. Well, I'm not going to make the mistake of so many of the analysts who've come before me who predicted, <laughs> given a number to, when this regime was going to collapse. I think one thing that we should, one of the challenges for us is that we have so little access. So that means we have very little understanding of how that society operates, how they think. But one thing I can tell you is that we need to look at it through a Korean filter, first of all. Korean people are. Uh, as the panel know, they very proud. They have a sense of identity and national pride that has, is a part of their, and John and I were talking about this, part of their heritage that has been built over thousands of years. They call themselves the shrimp, shrimp among whales. There's a fro uh, proverb that says, if the whales play, it's the shrimp that gets hurt. And so Koreans have always recognized that they are sandwiched between these major superpowers um, and that if they don't protect themselves, that they are going to be exterminated. So they have a fierce sense of national pride. That's true of the South Koreans. If you know any South Koreans, you know how stubborn and proud they are. It's true of the North Koreans as well. So they have a singular sense of identity. Also, I should point out that the regime has used the war, the Korean War, and the animosity and the, the conflict with the United States to build a sense of I don't know what it, how you call it, but they, they have maintained this sense that they are still in a state of war. They've maintained this sense that they are still actively fighting off outside aggression. And there is nothing like the threat from an outside force to bring people together. And so the regime has used that propaganda 
to bring, give a sen the people a sense of unity. So I would just say that I don't expect to see an Arab Spring, for example. This is a, a people who have a very homogenous background, have a certain history. So look at it through that Korean filter, the history, the filter of Korean history and its place in this region. That said, I think we just don't know because we don't know exactly what's happening. Even if I'm there on the ground, I don't quite know what's happening uh, internally. That is so opaque to us. But don't you think that, I mean, I'm just struck more in talking to defectors that uh, in kind of until the famine period, that it seemed that most people, that brainwashing basically worked, that people got the government propaganda, they basically absorbed it and believed in it, and that in recent years, partly because of the famine, partly because there's been so much interaction with China, so many Koreans going into China, so many rumors that China is so much better off, uh, so many uh, thumb drives coming in, so many DVDs coming in, that especially in border areas, and especially maybe in those who were more affluent, that it's not the same North Korea as, as 25 years ago, and that there may be some kinds of rumblings about discontent toward the regime, and I, I agree, nothing like an Arab Spring, but do you think we're right to, that there is, that it, there is a real difference in character today versus the past? I think it's important to remember that I always think of North Korea as a kind of monarchy, like a modern day monarchy. And with a monarchy, you need to keep that court economy intact. You need to keep the elites happy. And so these elites are actually very important in North Korea. Every time I flew in and out of Pyongyang, I flew on an air choreo plane that was filled with North Koreans, students, businessmen, bureaucrats, athletes. These are people who were going in and out of the country going through Beijing and seeing what the outside world was like. Frankly, I would sit next to these North Koreans who, like me, would have to turn their cell phones in. So they had Samsung phones, iPhones, so they knew what life was like. They were as addicted as we are to their smartphones when they were outside North Korea. Now, Kim Jong-un knows he has to keep them happy as well because they are the ones who are propping him up and, keep, and, and really keeping him in power. So even though we tend to think of them as just the elite, they play a very important role in keeping that system, the political system, intact. We have seen a couple signs and examples in the last few years of people, very high level people from that class, defect. And this is a difference than in previous years. So we have the deputy ambassador from the North Korean embassy in London who defected a few years ago. Uh, and he's probably one of the more high profile defectors. Uh, and, and these are people who we hadn't seen defect so frequently in the past. So that perhaps is a sign that there's some discontent among that very important class. Nick? Yeah. Nick, if I, if I could, I mean, your basic question is, is there going to be a change in government, say, in 10 years? And, you know, as a politician, I'll, you, you, first thing you say is never say never. I think nonetheless, and I don't think there's that, there is a remote situation. I remember the last trip I made to North Korea was with Eric Schmidt of Google. And Eric's objective and our objective, and Gene was on that trip, mm -hmm. was to bring the internet to North Korea. The, the, we didn't think we had a very good chance. <laughs> but I can tell you that you know, we, when we went into schools, we went in to talk to the government leaders, business leaders, there was, there was quite a bit of interest. The government didn't allow it, right? I, I think you never say never why because what springs revolutions? One, lacks of, lack of freedom, and two, the economy. You know, the economy in North Korea is not in good shape. Now, Kim Jong-un says he's going to transform it, private sector, and he, I think he is different than his father. His father was, you know, he wanted aid, food, nuclear reactors. I think this guy wants more private sector activity from what I've learned with uh, in interactions with the South Koreans, that he wants you know, McDonald's there, that he wants uh, more of a private sector enterprise. Um, that, that's in his favor in staying in office. But you never, um, I, I, and I hear what you said, they, they hear about what's happening in China, they hear about what's happening in South Korea. I mean, they're not totally under an umbrella where they don't know what's going on. They, they, they hear, and it's through families, and probably Gene's the best one to, 
to assess this. Um, so I think there's also a challenge for Kim Jong-un, those that say, oh, you know, the cult of personality is going to stay there forever. I think the odds are that he, 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 he has traction for a period of time. But you know, I guess I'll conclude again, you never say never. And you may not have brought uh, quite the internet to Pyongyang, but I tweeted with this phone uh, from North Korea using the SIM cards that, I mean, if you are a foreigner and you hand over your passport and you pay a fortune, you can get a SIM card that actually does access the internet. Uh, and and Nick, phone. you know this very well. I read your column on Sunday. And you said that one of the reasons you went to Japan uh, to be the correspondent for the New York Times, you thought that North Korea was going to fall, right? In the 1990s. <laughs> and, and that's when I met you, when I yep. brought one of the that's right. prisoners back. So yeah. we've, been, we've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Nakayama san, um, so um, Governor Richardson earlier talked about human rights as a factor in the negotiations. And so to what extent should President Trump bring up these issues of human rights, either in the sense of the kidnapped Japanese? And you know, on the one hand, my heart just goes out to those families whose kids were kidnapped on the beach, Megumi-san. Uh, but it's been 40 years since she was kidnapped. We don't know if she's still alive. Uh, should a small number of those detainees be an obstacle to try to resolve an enormous geopolitical crisis. And likewise, you know, human rights within North Korea, uh, the labor camps, I think there is a general sense that the conditions are about as bad as they can get. But is this the moment to raise those concerns? Uh, <clears throat> please don't say uh, Megumi Yokota is not alive or not. We believe that she will alive. And never say never. So uh, I think, I hope, uh, even, you know, the Moon, Moon, President Moon Jae-in called our prime minister. He talked with Kim Jong-un about this issue, the human rights issue, abduction issues. And uh, the President Trump, also he will uh, say directly to uh, Kim Jong-un, this is uh, uh, really thank to those presidents. But I hope one day uh, our Prime Minister Abe directly negotiate uh, bilaterally between the Kim Jong-un. I think it happened after uh, US and uh, North Korea bilateral meeting. And uh, I think uh, the Mr. Kim Jong-un afraid about uh, he, will, he will be a possi possibly he will be a become like a Qaddafi of Libya. But uh, on the other hand, what, then what is his model, image? I think his model is he wants to become like a pillar, pillar of the uh, balance scale. And uh, so one, hand, one plate in China, one plate in US. I don't know, Russia, maybe he, this plate. And uh, he wants to not like Hong Kong, controlled by Chinese government no freedom for him. I think his model is Japanese emperor system. After World War II, the end, occupation army, general headquarters came to my country. And they made a 3S, 5D, you know, the order, uh, order to the Japanese. And uh, before, during the war, we, our ancestors thought our emperor is a god, as a god. But General MacArthur knew it. So he take photo with our emperor at that time. And uh, he is not a god. He is an emperor. But he, GHQ, the, the occupation army, never uh, killed our emperor. And uh, so Kim Jong-un and Japan now became a very big country as an economy, a very investable, unique country now in East Asia. And Kim Jong-un. Uh, wants to chase with South Korea using Japanese model after the war. So Mr. Kim would like to become a symbol of the North Korea. This is what he is writing for the future story for himself. 
And one quick question. There's been a lot of, uh, there's been some reports uh, from South Korea that Kim Jong-un had transmitted through Moon Jae-in an invitation to Prime Minister Abe to meet with Kim Jong-un. Can, can you say if that is correct? Um, we have to be careful still. Um, he sent a letter, it's OK. He smiled, it's OK. He is wearing Giorgio Armani, it's OK. But <laughs> action, we need move. We, we don't need move, but uh, we need movement from the old world together. But also, he, Mr. Kim Jong, have to do something. Erase nuclear, clean up, and no more, uh, how do you say, laboratories for the biochemical weapons, or you know, like uh, moving of the uh, ninja activities for all the world. Please. Be gentle. So no Abe Kim summit for the time being, but down the road, who knows? Uh, I don't know. The professor knows it. But uh, he said, he made a comment about uh, this issue. Uh, the vision is a really long road that was a long and winding road. Yeah. That's what the Harvard professor said. I believe so. Yeah. I want to become a student of his class. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to just go through my panelists and uh, ask them for, to push them for percentage chances if they're willing to do that on various outcomes that we're all kind of wondering about in the case of North Korea. Um, so, you know, what percent chance that there will indeed be full de denuclearization? I'd, I'd like to use as a time frame. Uh, 2021, this the Milken conference in 2021, uh, after the end of the of this presidential uh, term. So, uh, for starters, what percent chance Milken conference 2021, North Korea has fully handed over all of its nuclear warheads in some verifiable way has has fully ended its uh, nuclear program? I would, um, I'll go first. I'll say uh, five percent. Jean? So if we're wrong, we're not going to be invited back. No. <laughs> um, I, I, I would probably say even lower than that. <laughs> OK. Nakayama-san, can we venture a, a prediction from you? Uh, we are now focusing on North Korea. Yes. 100%. But I personally, uh, we, ha we don't have to forget about the Taiwan. I think 2020, when we, when we are going to have an Olympic and Paralympics game, I think the Taiwan Stripe will be a little bit, uh, how do you say, messy or very tensioned. So might be small conflict between mainland China and Taiwan. And, and uh, you folk too much focusing on Korea Peninsula, maybe. Watch, watch this area. Too. It's good to remind us of that as yep. well. Uh, John, per percent chance of full denuclearization uh, by this time in 2021? I think it all depends. What I laid out, uh, the terrain being different, it's not an easy cop out, but really there's so much at the play right now. And it's happening behind closed doors at the top level. So the State Department of the United States, the Foreign Ministry in South Korea, the Foreign Ministry in North Korea, they've all been completely cut out. And so from that, if this gamble, and South Korea has been assuming a tremendous amount and using a lot of their political capital, if that risk pays off, then this idea of what they agreed to being acceptable, and that's the, the operative word because it's a political decision at the end of the day of you know, handing over the fissile material, the ICBMs, but then retaining a small number of nuclear warheads, whatever they decide is the definition of uh, this process of progress and denuclearization, that's all political. And so for me, uh, I, I think we have to see what more of these revelations are, are coming out. But uh, again, I have to think we have to look at some of these old maps in terms of how we understand the Korean Peninsula. Bill? 20%. 20%. And, but there's got to be proper inspections. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But I'll, I'll go out on a limb, 20%. OK. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid we are uh, out of time. We're turning into pumpkins. Um, but I would like to thank you all for joining us, and I'd especially like you to join me in thanking our panel and wrestling with these problems today.